Thank you guys for coming today. Hopefully as we get started, some more people will uh, trickle in. Uh, this is our second session in our Ambassador Adv um, Advocacy Series. And we're going to have Kelly Cox from Miami Waterkeeper, who's going to be our speaker. Um, you'll notice the uh, surveys that are on all the chairs. Those are for after the uh, session is over. Um, we need the, we, we pay for these types of events through grants and donations and things like that. And this event in particular is um, funded by uh, an EPA grant for environmental education. And we do these surveys so that we can report back to the EPA what kind of an impact we're having. So it's really helpful for us if you guys can fill those out at the end and then give them back to me. I'll hand out kind of this towards the end. Uh, I mentioned in the first session that we are trying to give um, sort of an incentive for people to uh, come to all three or at least as many of um, the, the series as they can. Uh, so if you were at the first session, I have a sign up sheet in the back. Um, if you weren't able to make the first session uh, for one reason or another, but you do plan on coming to this session and the next session, uh, please still sign up at the back and just so I, I know. And then at the end of the third session, we're going to give you something that's a reusable bag with some, you know, fun stuff inside. <laughs> and with that, Kelly, I'll hand it off to you. Hey everyone, thank, thank you so much for joining us today. As Romeo mentioned, my name is Kelly Cox. I'm the Staff Attorney and Program Director at Miami Waterkeeper. We are, if you weren't here last time, a local nonprofit that's dedicated to providing swimmable, drinkable, and fishable water to South Florida. And we do that through uh, education and outreach, in-house scientific research, and legal advocacy where appropriate. Our core mission areas are marine ecosystem protection, providing clean water as it pertains to drinking water and swimming and surface waters, and advocating for a sea level rise resilient South Florida. Today, in the second part of this series, uh, which some of you are, are re repeat offenders, coming back again for more, we're so excited to have you. Quick look at navigating local government. So a lot of the environmental advocacy piece and uh, being a good environmentalist really relies on your ability to navigate, unfortunately, the bureaucracy that we live in. And so part of the work that we do at Waterkeeper is finding the ways that work to implement the advocacy changes we want to see. And to do that, we have to have a pretty comprehensive understanding of local government, how it relates to state government and federal government, what's actionable, what's achievable, and how we can really make a difference for our environment here in South Florida. So we're gonna talk about that today. A few of the things that you're gonna to learn today are going to bring you back to Civics 101. So we're gonna talk briefly about our constitutional system, the three branches of government. We'll talk about separation of powers and judicial review uh, as it pertains to federalism. We'll also take a look at state and local government in Florida specifically. Uh, state governments and local governments vary greatly across the nation. Uh, we'll look at the different roles of the governments, uh, how they work together, uh, and sometimes how they work against each other. We'll take a specific look at county cities and home rule authority. Uh, and then after, we'll take a look at how to create our own advocacy plans. We'll choose some issues, we'll do a little breakout session, uh, and we'll identify our forums, allies, opponents, how to navigate this system in a real world com uh, context. So we'll do a little workshop just at the end, briefly, it'll be very informal, just so we get some practice and how we can actually take some steps to address issues in our community. So first step, uh, as I mentioned, Civics 101, we'll take a look at the constitutional system. And this will surely be a refresher for all of you, but I, I like to review it myself every once in a while. I know I'm an attorney too. Um, I think it's important to remember, especially in this day and age, uh, how our constitution uh, delineates powers uh, to the different branches of government. So as you know, our, our constitution has a preamble in seven different articles. Uh, it also establishes a system of checks and balances through our three primary branches, which are our executive, legislative, and judicial branch. Uh, it establishes powers, it establishes functions, um, and a fun fact, it was written on parchment paper in 1787. So I really like the scene of the signing of the Constitution of the United States. I think it's uh, sort of a nod to what was actually going on at the time. The folks that were involved in the drafting and the signing of the Constitution were predominantly white men uh, that were also landowners. Um, so as you can tell, this, 
this is sort of a nod to the fact that our country and our government, in a lot of respects, has changed since the Constitution. And uh, it sort of uh, implies that, in some respects, the Constitution is now viewed as a dynamic document uh, and is interpreted often within modern day context because, uh, as you can tell from this picture alone, uh, it might not have been uh, as reasonable if it were interpreted in the same context that these folks intended it to be, word for word. Uh, there are some, some factions, uh, especially on the Supreme Court, that believe in a textualist interpretation of the Constitution, so word for word, what does it mean, what did the readers intend? Uh, there is some divergence in the legal community as to whether or not uh, that's appropriate for this day and age, but I just think that this is a really representative photo of what we were dealing with at the time, in uh, 1776. So part two, in terms of the anatomy of the Constitution, we have our amendments, and that's the part uh, that folks are generally a lot more familiar with. Um, the amendments one through 10 are known as the Bill of Rights, as you guys know, uh, which outline our individual rights and freedoms. Uh, and they also reserve certain powers to the state and individuals. Um, a lot of countries across the globe actually have environmental rights written into their Bill of Rights in their constitution, which is something that's really interesting and something that we don't have. Um, in, our, while our environmental laws are fundamentally based in constitutional law, um, we do not have it enumerated into our constitution that we're entitled to certain environmental quality, uh, whereas other countries certainly do. We also have part three of our anatomy, which is amendments 11 through 27. Uh, and these address a wide variety of different topics from civil rights to prohibition and subsequent repeal of prohibition. Uh, to presidential election procedure, presidential succession, and income tax. Uh, they are pieced together over time, in, over time in congressional records, so uh, there's not actually a really nice long document that we get to go into the Library of Congress and say, let me see the entire Constitution. It's actually more pieced together through a variety of different amendments over time. Uh, the last constitutional amendment, uh, the 27th, was ratified in 1992, and for the life of me, I can never remember what it was. Maybe you can tell me. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more in depth about the balance of powers uh, within our constitutional framework. As you know, uh, the executive branch is the president and his cabinet and also includes independent governmental agencies, which we'll talk about in a second, the administrative state and how that works into the environment and environmental protection. The president, as you know, has the power to veto laws. He also, also receives military and foreign relations, as we all are very well aware of uh, today. Uh, Congress um, is the legislative branch, uh, and they have the power to override a presidential veto. They have the power to, uh, to draft laws, create laws. Um, it's composed of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, the House of Representatives and the number of representatives that we have uh, from our state varies compared to other states that's based on population, right? Whereas senators, um, at each state gets two senators. Uh, the Congress, Congress has the power to override a presidential veto and approve presidential nominees, including federal judges. Uh, the final branch is our judicial branch, and of course, as the name suggests, uh, is composed of the court system. Uh, so the Supreme Court is the highest court uh, within our judicial branch, and then on the way down, we have the, the appellate court, the court of appeals, and the district courts that represent the respective districts throughout the nation. Uh, the responsibilities of the court system and the judicial branch are to interpret the laws that Congress drafts. Uh, they're also able to settle disputes between states, which often arise, uh, and declare laws unconstitutional. Now, individuals, as citizens of the United States, have the ability to influence each branch of government. As you know, we can elect our, our representatives and our senators. We can elect the president. Uh, and, of course, we can elect judges as well. But it's a little bit more complicated than that, as it always is. These are what we call the kind of sort of maybe other branches of government. And this is a, a term that my dear friend Leah Weston coined herself, the kind of sort of maybe branches, uh, which include administrative agencies and the media machine. Administrative agencies are particularly important to environmental issues. And why is that? Well, administrative agencies are a delegated power from the executive branch of the government to promulgate, that means to draft, regulations. Uh, so they draft regulations and they also enforce 
those regulations and environmental rules. And some of the rel our relevant administrative agencies that we work with um, and that environmental groups all over the country work with include the EPA, uh, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, OSHA, Fish and Wildlife, National Marine Fisheries Service, just uh, over on Virginia Key, the Army Corps, uh, Department of Justice, Department of Interior, Department of Energy, the list goes on, National Park Service. You can see that it's really varied. And as we work our way down into the state level and the local level, we also have administrative agencies. So you'll see we have the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, our state level EPA, uh, the Florida Public Service Commission, which oversees rates that we pay for our electricity. Um, and even more localized than that, we have the Miami-Dade Department of Environmental Resources Management, which you might hear uh, being referred to colloquially as DERM. Uh, but these are just some examples of the administrative state, and it definitely uh, complicates the framework that we work in, in terms of environmental protection uh, and advocacy. So let's talk a little bit more in depth about state and local government in Florida. This is a, an infographic which is not meant to be read <laughs> for the purposes of this course, but is meant to be illustrative of the fact of how our government at the Florida, Florida state level is divided. So you see we still have a division of executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government. However, as it breaks down, you can see that there seems to be a lot of complexity coming down from the executive branch of government. And that's because of the administrative state. So we have a lot of different uh, agencies that are working under executive power at the state level. So what exactly does this state government do? Well, the 10th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution reserves many powers to the state. Some of them include crime and punishment, uh, land development and real estate, regulating businesses, voting in elections, taxation, among other things. That's why you might say, oh, well, why don't we have income tax in Florida, but you might have it in North Carolina. This is why, because the state government is allowed to decide the taxing authority. And of course, as I mentioned, it does have that similar structure to, this, to the federal branch, while it is somewhat different. Um, however, one of the key distinctions is that unlike the U.S. Constitution, citizens in the state of Florida can amend the constitution of the state by initiative, by referendum. That means if you get enough signatures, you can bring a ballot item to have our constitution amended. That sounds really great, but also it can be very complicated. And that means that we tend to have a significant number of amendments to our state constitution. What do counties and cities do? We're filtering down the powers even further. So the state consists of these smaller units of government, municipalities, they are called, or counties, and they're also called villages, towns, um, and, and so on, but they're all basically municipal governments that oversee their respective jurisdictions. So what do municipalities do? Well, they, they oversee things like trash collection, police and fire services, planning and zoning, building safety, parks and recreation, and local property taxes. You can see by this map, this is the division of the state of Florida into counties, and there's a lot of different counties in Florida. But of course, as I mentioned earlier, it's just a little bit more complicated than that. And this is where we start to get into the nitty gritty environmental law stuff that I love so much. Um, cities and counties sometimes in the state of Florida have something called home rule authority. Uh, this home rule authority originated in a concept called Dillon's Rule, which is an old court case that says cities are creatures of the state, meaning that the federal government delegates certain powers to the state government, the state government delegates certain powers to the local government, and if it weren't for the state government, the local government would be sort of meaningless. Only 20 counties in the state of Florida, highlighted in green on this map, are home rule counties. What does that mean, Kelly? Well, home rule counties are counties that have a charter. And a charter is basically a mini constitution for that county. And the county uh, that has the charter gets the ability to self-govern. And in order to have this ability to self-govern, they've had to petition the state for that power. So why does this matter? And why wouldn't everyone want to be a home rule county? Well, 
we start to, over time, we started to see that as population centers grew and developed in Florida, uh, that there were greater demands for a local authority. We couldn't rely on the state anymore to oversee uh, local planning and building codes in the way that we wanted to in Miami-Dade County, for example. So we chartered our, we created a charter and we petitioned the state for our power to be a home rule county, which gave us a little bit more authority in the decision making um, process uh, that previously existed. Now, some other counties remain uh, non-charter counties, non-home rule counties, so they don't have the authority that we have, for example, in Miami-Dade. Uh, those counties are not highlighted in green, and you'll see they tend to be our more rural counties in the state of Florida, with a few exceptions. So what this ultimately means is that Miami-Dade County has more independence from the state of Florida on a variety of local issues. You might start to see where I'm going with this. This means that we have the power, the decision-making authority to propagate and enforce our own rules without the state of Florida intervening and telling us that we can't, so long as those local decisions do not impact previous state decisions. So let's take a closer look at the county. Um, you'll see this is actually one of my favorite uh, maps of local government and how it's set up. And that's because county residents are actually at the top. And that's something I fundamentally believe to be true and I really support. I believe that we as residents and citizens are in charge of our local government. And I hope you all have that same sort of identity. Um, and so county residents being the electorate are at the top on this map. And then you'll see again a similar division of powers. Um, with a little bit more complexity um, down to our executive branch, which is our mayor, and our board of county commissioners, our legislative branch, of course, and then, of course, the 11th Circuit uh, judicial system. So you'll see it breaks down uh, into a variety of agencies and different commissions. Uh, so it's a little bit more different than, than the state government uh, from, and from the federal government, frankly, but uh, this is how we operate. So. The electorate, the county residents here have the most power, and, and I believe that to be true, and I think that's really important as we navigate environmental advocacy. So looking even closer at Miami-Dade County, um, this map was pulled from a Miami Geographic map, um, and I know it can be a little bit hard to see, but this PowerPoint will be available online for your perusal after this training. Um, and in Miami-Dade County, we have 36 individual incorporated municipalities, including the one that we're in now. They consist of cities, towns, villages, and they each have their own government. Now, each individual municipality has its own government with its respective council or its commission, uh, but we also have a broader county government, which oversees unincorporated areas as well as certain incorporated areas uh, pursuant to some enumerated powers. So if you take a look at this map over here, you can see which areas are actually incorporated. And they're in blue, the different shades of blue, but you'll see on the westward side that there's a significant portion of Miami-Dade County that remains unincorporated. And this little uh, pie chart here outlines exactly uh, the size of what we're talking about in terms of incorporated municipalities versus not incorporated. So uh, the total population is 2.6 million. Um, we've got 44% of unincorporated Miami-Dade County in that 2.6 million. The next largest city is the city of Miami um, at 16% of the total population. After that, Hialeah, Miami Gardens, then Miami Beach, Homestead, North Miami, Coral Gables, Doral, and then other municipalities including Key Biscayne. So I think that's a pretty interesting uh, look at exactly how geographically we're distributed and where the population centers really are in terms of incorporated municipalities. So pop quiz, do you know where you're sitting right now? The village of Key Biscayne, that's right. Strong work, everyone. <laughs> Sometimes people don't know, they think, oh, I'm in Miami County or I'm in the city of Miami. Technically, you cross over, bear cut, and you're in the city of Miami. So it can be very confusing for a lot of folks. So one of the things that I really want you all to take away, um, which if you're at this training means you're a little bit more engaged than the average bear, um, is that you have a, a, a lot on your plate and there's
matters a lot more than voting for just the big one every four years. And taking a look at our state government and our local government, at the state level, you can vote for the governor, you can vote for your state senator, there's 40 districts in our state, our state representative, 120 districts in the state of Florida, um, the Supreme Court justices, uh, Miami-Dade County, you can vote for mayor, you can vote for county commissioner, there's 13 districts, we just had a county commission election a few weeks ago for District 5, uh, for circuit and county court judges, 123 judges you can vote for. It. And you can vote for your city, town, or village, mayor, commissioner, council, and various other systems. Some folks have a, uh, a sheriff that you can vote for, for example. So now we're going to talk briefly about creating an advocacy plan. So, yes, Kelly, thank you for the civics introduction. It's been really riveting, but I'm here to talk about environmental issues in my community. I'm with you. We're getting to it. First up is we have to get organized. So, when we're identifying environmental issues, we have to first narrow down what is the issue, right? So, is your issue pollution? Can we narrow it even farther? Is it plastic pollution? Is it toxic pollution? Is it nutrient runoff? Um, is it water quality, marine life, climate change? I mean, these issues are pretty broad here, but it helps to be able to narrow your issue as far as you can. So, what's something that really speaks to you? Do you really care about wildlife? Do you really care, care about access to the water and your ability to put your boat in on the weekend? Uh, do you care about composting and food waste or recycling? Um, so that's the very first step is identifying what really puts a fire in your belly. What really gets you going and gets you worked up? What's a problem in your community that should really be resolved or at least have some attention focused on? Step two, and this is a little bit more difficult of a step, is identifying your forum. So, once you uh, identify your issue, then you want to identify, okay, well, where exactly is this issue occurring in my community? I'm really concerned about uh, pollution on our beaches. I'm particularly concerned about plastic pollution on our beaches. Which beaches? Miami Beach? That's a municipality. But the county beach, or the beach itself is managed by the county. Am I concerned about Crandon Park? Um, am I concerned about Bill Bags? Well, that's a state park, so that's a different jurisdiction than a county beach, right? So there's a lot of different uh, issues that tie into the forum. The first step is, let's just identify where is this issue even located? Is it in a city? Is it in a body of water? Um, does the problem affect multiple areas? That could very well be true. We just had a sewage leak last summer, right? Right off of Virginia Key, and that affected multiple areas. Who has power over the issue? Does it involve legislation? Is there somebody that's trying to make some changes to the law? Does it involve law enforcement? Is the problem really that we don't have folks out there ticketing um, people who are poaching undersized lobster? Um, is there a dispute over whether or not the government itself is acting legally? We sometimes deal with that at Waterkeeper. Who is going to oppose your position? We're trying to ban plastic bags. That's not really making the Retail Federation happy. They're going to oppose our position to ban plastic bags. Who's going to lobby against your position? Where is the funding going to come from? What change is necessary is the next question to ask. Does the law need to change? Does awareness need to be raised around the issue? Do we just need to shine a light on it and get people really riled up? Is it a change to how enforcement is being done? Does the law exist but nothing's being done with the existing law? Uh, and maybe will the issue require a court challenge? And how will you personally affect change? That's the next step. Are you going to write or lobby your elected officials? Are you going to participate in a public meeting? Are you going to stand up and speak and voice your opinion? Are you going to call the media? Are you going to call our friend Jenny Stilinovich at the Herald, our wonderful environmental writer, and say, hey, Jenny, this is a huge problem. We need to, we need to cover it. Or are you going to hire an attorney and go to court? Are you going to use your right as a citizen to enforce environmental laws? Step three to advocacy planning is planning your strategy. So uh, for, for us, one of the very first things that you can do is communicate with your elected officials. And so few people do this. And I personally think it's very important to create a relationship and foster relationships with your elected officials wherever you live. You can do one of the following things. You can write a letter or email. You can make a simple phone call. I was actually 
telling Dana today, I said, um, uh, a few years ago when all this environmental legislation was changing so rapidly, I printed out a list of contact information for my elected officials uh, and I put it in my phone so every time I was stuck in traffic in Miami, I would call my elected officials with my <laughs> list of, of issues that I had that day and they were like, okay, Kelly, nice to hear from you again. But I think that that is really important and making those phone calls is really valuable. You can use social media. Our elected officials certainly use social media, so we should use the power of social media as well. Or you can have an in-person meeting. You are the constituent, you are a part of the electorate, you are the one that helped to put these people in power, or maybe you did it. Regardless, they represent you with your interests in your community. So take a meeting with them. It might take you a few weeks, it might take you a few days, it might take you a few months. Get some FaceTime in with your elected officials. Let them know that you care, that you're invested in your community and the issues that you're working on. The other step you can take is you can participate directly in governmental procedures. You can speak at a public meeting. I regularly speak at commission, um, especially my immediate county commission about issues. Although a few weeks ago, I was here at the Key Biscayne uh, Council speaking about plastic straws. Uh, you can join a citizen's advisory board. There are a lot of different advisory boards related to a variety of different issues from affordable housing to waterfront development. Uh, you can join a citizen's advisory board and get really involved in monthly meetings and decision makings and you can provide advisory opinions to your elected officials about whatever issues you're really concerned about. Or you can run for office yourself. Uh, a lot of folks think that that sounds really intimidating. Uh, but there are a lot of people, I have to tell you, sitting in this room that are probably more qualified to run for public office than a lot of our public officials. So I think that we should all be invested and uh, consider that option uh, as you navigate these issues yourself. And the next step, of course, is to spread the words and get other, other people involved. And I think this is really, really a critical piece. You can organize like-minded friends. That's probably the lowest hanging fruit, right? Get people involved to say, you hate straws on the beach, I hate straws on the beach, let's make a difference about straws on the beach. You can contact local media, as I mentioned, especially if it's a particularly good story. Or you can personally educate others and reach out to those that might not be as like-minded as you. You can post on, on social media, you can share with each other over dinner about something interesting that you heard on the radio or something that you saw um, or even just drawing people's attention to some local issues like if you're going to the going to i don't know a restaurant with your friend and they want to take a, a doggy bag home you can say hey maybe don't bring that bag with you um, and just carry out your box instead you don't really need that bag those sorts of like basic levels of of education can really make a difference in generating awareness about particular issues. And I think there's great value in that. And then of course, the final option, if the government is not responding to your concerns and you've been ever so diligent to, to make a good faith effort to have them addressed, you can go to court and that's something that we do at Waterkeeper. Um, we don't do it lightly, it's sort of our last case scenario, but it is a tool in our toolbox that we use to address environmental harms and to hold polluters accountable. Our court system is really a great tool to do that and puts us on a level playing field with folks that might have a lot more resources than we do. Um, and that's in great part uh, thanks to citizen supervisions. And for those of you who don't know, citizen supervisions are uh, clauses that are written to a lot of our major environmental laws, um, including the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, Clean Air Act, and on and on. And what it does is it gives citizens who live in an area where they're experiencing some sort of environmental harm the ability to go to court on behalf of the resource or on behalf of the harm that they're experiencing and to sue the government, to sue the, the private corporation or, the, the, or another individual for violations of those rights that are created through our core environmental statutes. So uh, we've had uh, some folks, even here on Key Biscayne, we had someone help us at Miami Waterkeeper give us standing to bring a lawsuit related to our sewage infrastructure back when we first found it in uh, 2012, I believe, was the lawsuit. So um, even in this community, we've had folks stand up um, to advocate for our water resources and allow us to go to court on their behalf. And um, that's part of what we do, as I mentioned, at Waterkeeper. And 
we require a, a healthy membership base in order to do that. Um, so if you are a member, I encourage you to become a member of Miami Waterkeeper so we can continue advocating in the legal system on your behalf and on um, behalf of resources. So now we're going to take a few moments um, and we're going to run through some advocacy scenarios amongst ourselves. We're going to do a very informal workshop. Um, Dana's going to walk around with some scenarios. So if you want to group together in little clusters for a brief discussion, that'd be great. But before we do that, I'm happy to take any questions that you have about um, this framework, uh, our, our governmental system, our environmental issues. Yes? Just as we're sitting here, sure. uh, Joan told me that from Channel 10 and I got from Channel 6 a message about the water being a swimming, advisory. swimming advisory at Crandon Park. No swim. Wow. And I just came out of the ocean at Cape <laughs> Florida. Are you glowing? <laughs> yes, I, I was wonderful. It looked clean and wonderful. Who knows what's in there? Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, that's really important information. That's something that um, we have been working on at Waterkeeper too because um, I don't know if you all heard, but Dog Beach and Crandon Beach were closed on the 4th of July. Yeah. Um, and we've had some very real notice issues with that and informing the public that the beaches are actually closed and the water quality is bad because there's fecal bacteria in the water and um, you know positive sewage indicators. So um, that's something that we're really concerned about and we're working on. I called on that because at 3.16 in the afternoon, they lifted on the 4th right. of July. But on the 2nd and 3rd of July, there was no warning. Right. Not right. from the, the TV stations or anybody. Yeah. I don't know if that was because they didn't want to ruin the holiday. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I'm not super sure what happened. I do know that the, my, or the Florida Department of Health has a Miami-Dade division um, that oversees this sampling. And they did put a press release on their webpage. They are not statutorily required to disseminate that information beyond what they are already doing. So they're required to flip those metal signs up on the beaches and say that there is no swimming allowed because there is fecal bacteria in the water. Um, they post a little press release on their website, but otherwise they inform the municipalities and then it's the municipal responsibility to notify the public beyond that. So um, we're trying to raise awareness about this and we're working with the Florida Department of Health. We're grateful that they're even sampling. <laughs> Um, and we're grateful they have the budget to do that. Um, uh, but we are trying to um, have them create some social media accounts and things like that so that the average person would get the information more readily. And not to mention the fact that um, the signs themselves on the beaches are pretty sparse um, and very far apart. So there's many ways that you can enter the beach without ever seeing a closure sign. Yeah? Um, about the same thing, uh, I do actually remember seeing Rachel posted a live video on Facebook yeah. where she was on the beach on the 4th of July when it was supposed to be, you know, there was a the swimming advisory. It was covered in people. Yeah. They're just everywhere in the water and everything. Um, one thing that uh, for, for people, at least that live on the key, they have um, an emergency notification system and you can sign up for it on the, the website somewhere. I can't remember offhand where. Uh, but I actually found out about it because they sent out um, both the text message and email oh, great. Uh, saying that there was a swimming spent the whole afternoon on the phone with all these people. I used to have a list of numbers and names and 
from four or five years ago, and I misplaced it, so I had to start from zero. They say that every Monday they test in Crandon, they test at Cape Florida, and they test on the other side, which is we have, you know, the Dog Beach or Kobe Beach. Mm -hmm. And they get the results back. This is what I was told last Friday. They get the results back on Tuesday morning. If the results are under a certain percentage, then there's nothing more to do until the following Monday. If it's over that, they retest on Tuesday, and then they advise of each closure. But I, Ramin said that she got a I'm on that emergency thing and I get this closures for the, the road closures and things like that. But I got nothing on the 2nd or 3rd of, wow. of, of July about that. Oh, the, I didn't either. I only got it on the 4th and I'll do it. Well, and I got it on the 4th in the afternoon that it was lifted. Yeah. Part, part, yeah, part of the issue too is that in order for the advisory to be triggered, you have to get two negative readings in a row. So something else that we're working on at sort of a state level, regulatory level, is um, hopefully encouraging them to change. If they read poorly on one reading, then that needs to be noticed. Um, because people should have um, the opportunity to decide for themselves whether or not they want to get in the water after one negative reading. Or positive reading. Positive for positive. fecal bacteria. <laughs> I guess we're all beach goers. So sure. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so, so no, it's good. Hit me. I'm ready. So, do we think that is dog poop or people poop from the sewage plant? It's hard to say without some some source sewage. tracking. Um, so, it really depends. It could be a mixture of both. Um, dog beach, I would venture to guess is more dogs. Um, uh, but it, I don't want to speculate because there hasn't been source tracking done to determine exactly what the source is. I do know that. Because um, we had that huge leak. Right. Generally speaking, and this is a generalization, uh, during during rain events and after rain events, we tend to see more human fecal bacteria because of septic fields flooding and floodwaters rushing off from from um, uh, stormwater runoff into the bay. Um, so that is a generalization, not always true, but um, it's an issue we have. Other questions before we move? Sir, right here on the causeway, you know, people who come in just dog deer for a few days. It's one more that's been there for about five weeks. So, what, what happens with their um, toilet system? So, they're supposed to do pump outs, um, which means that it's like if you had an RV or something, uh, uh, or uh, some sort of camper, you can't just keep that. In the camper forever, you have to do something with it. So they're supposed to bring it to a pump out station, uh, which is generally a marina that has those types of facilities, and they they pump out their sewage from off board. This is what they're supposed to do. I yeah, they have in um, yeah, they have it in Crandon. Um, I don't know how frequently that is happening. I know that sometimes there are illicit discharges um, where folks don't want to go and pump out, but um, it's hard to say without um, the enforcement. Um, and as you all know, our enforcement is dramatically underfunded here, um, at both the state level in the national park, and then of course here at the county level. So, um, it depends where the boats are. So, um, I, I think it's like a shared jurisdiction. I, I, I'm not quite sure exactly how the how the law enforcement agents work together. I know that like if they see something and they're like, oh well, that's happening in Bill Bags water, it's like. The National Park people are not going to be like, oh, well, we're not dealing with that. They'll obviously go over and deal with it. So, the other issue that I have is many, many years ago, the bear cut both sides of the cut. They did have a ranger because she was very good friend of mine and she patrolled. That's great. The boats were not allowed to come into the north side, going mm -hmm. to the north. Boats were not allowed to come uh, into that area. Where they all are now on the sandbar. Yeah, where they're all there now because there's that beautiful underwater forest mm -hmm. which used to be you could actually walk to it from Tina Skane along the beach. Wow. Now you can't do that. And these boats are there every weekend, mm -hmm. sometimes one week. In fact, Sunday I was going on to the island, I actually stopped because they were speeding up and down all the way and just in and out everywhere. 
and there was no money in controls. Right. No, it's, it's definitely an issue. We're, we're seeing it too at the at the wildlife preserve, the Bill Sadowski Wildlife Preserve. It's supposed to be a, a no entry zone for wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, and during Hurricane Irma, they had their signs blown down and their blue buoys blew away. So now nobody even knows that this is supposed to be a no entry area and there's not very many folks. Why have the signs been Yes, it's probably as good as mine. I believe that falls into um, the county's jurisdiction in terms of, I know that the folks at the, actually the state wild, or the Biscayne Bay Aquatic Preserves program are working on the issue right now, but it's just a very basic thing where if they had some signs up on the, or even had the buoys out there, folks would be going in. Um, so. so this is something we're all interested in, but how, how does one affect any change? So these are very specific concerns to sure. our match to our coastline. So for you have a much broader perspective. Right. So and how far do you kind of zoom out and decide this is the thing that will affect and be some kind of a chain reaction that might make a difference? Yeah. Well, there's certainly no shortage of work to be done, as you guys can tell, uh, between uh, just looking at Key Biscayne and the issues that are affecting you all versus our jurisdiction is Miami-Dade and Broward County. So we, are, we do have a little bit of a broader scope, for sure. Um, what we try to do is, um, in part, we have our mission statement, which means that we're, we operate under this sort of umbrella of issues that we work on. So if it falls outside of our mission statement, then we unfortunately are not going to be able to work on it, regardless of its importance. So a great example of this is the, like the urban development boundary issues and the 826 expansion oh. uh, that's going on right now. That's something that I personally, um, as an individual and a member of this community, care deeply about. But it's a river, a river of grass. <laughs> right. But, but in my work capacity, that's something that we say, you know, this is better suited for folks who are very focused on Everglades issues and um, sustainable development. Um, so we, we do a little bit of, of have to say no to some issues, uh, but we try to take on as many as we can. And we're a small crew. We have four staff members. Um, and we. Uh, Take out a lot, of, a lot of issues with just our small team, but um, we're growing and hopefully with time we'll be able to address even more issues. But uh, one of the things that we do is we identify issues that uh, have a big impact for our community, um, but of course it doesn't mean that we turn our nose up at smaller issues either. Um, so great straws. That's yeah, so we're working on straws here in Key Biscayne. Key Biscayne is a small community, but we think that um, the key has been leaders for a lot of environmental issues just something that puts them out in front of everybody else and can serve as a really great model um, for the rest of Miami-Dade County, for Broward County, and for the state, frankly, in terms of taking steps to address um, plastic pollution. And, and, you know, little uh, shows of, uh, <laughs> of leadership in that regard can really make a world of difference in terms of um, leveraging, uh, leveraging that uh, advancement um, to, you know, encourage other municipalities to do the same. So. Um, it's hard to say how we choose our issues. We work with our board of directors and our executive director and try to evaluate cost benefit and exactly um, what we're gonna work on. But um, we've got a lot of different things going on right now from plastic pollution to nutrient loading to sewage issues to marine ecosystem protection to dredging projects and a lot of stuff in between. Other questions? If you are interested in learning about what we're working on, our website is a great resource. Um, It'll show you our issue areas. Um, and uh, another great area to look at is our press page. We're regularly contacted by the press to, to weigh in on certain issues. So it's a, that's regularly updated and has the most current information. What is your address? It's miamiwaterkeeper.org. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. yeah. You can just Google Miami Waterkeeper. It'll pop up. Oh, my so you're, is this a national organization as well? I'm sorry not to know. No, we are. Uh, it's a great question. I should have covered that at the beginning. We're, um, uh, Mighty Waterkeepers, so we are part of what's called the Greater Waterkeeper Alliance. All across the globe, there's more than 300 waterkeeper organizations. Uh, the waterkeeper movement started as a um, citizen action type of movement um, up on the Hudson River in New York. Um, back in the 1950s and 60s, a group of commercial fishermen noticed that there was a lot of pollution impacting the quality of the Hudson River, and that was impacting their ability uh, to provide for their families and um, to pull fish that were healthy out of the river and not contaminated. So they brought one of the first ever citizens lawsuits against some uh, polluters, uh, which included some factories and industry along the river, in addition to um, 
the city of New York because the city of New York used to dump its municipal sewage directly into the river without it being treated. Um, so they brought their first uh, successful citizen suit under the Rivers and Harbors Act and uh, they were able to win a bounty, so to speak, of about $5,000 and with that they bought a boat and they started patrolling the river um, and bringing more citizen suits and educating folks and talking to other fishermen and eventually it created a sort of a snowball effect and this model for education and outreach and, and advocacy became a really effective model and um, in the 80s and 90s uh, Bobby Kennedy got involved and uh, brought it into the Waterkeeper Alliance. So um, now all waterkeepers around the globe use this same model of educating folks in their communities, to, uh, engaging the citizenry, and, and advocating for environmental protection using uh, legal recourse when necessary. So we are the South Florida branch and we operate in the state of Broward County. There's something like, I think, 12 or 13 other waterkeepers in Florida. So if you ever are traveling, you can look them up. They, most waterkeepers hold events like this to educate the public and uh, to get folks involved in the issues. And as you can imagine, our water keepers in Florida are, are very busy right now uh, working on all these algae bloom issues that are yeah. happening up the coast. So. Water is released and that water is polluted and it goes out to the east coast and the west coast. That's right. Can you yeah, so I mean, that's generally the concept. Um, it, 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 it depends somewhat based on what the Army Corps of Engineers wants to do in terms of discharging the water, but the, I mean, you do hit the nail on the head. Once the water levels in the lake get too high, then they have to discharge a certain amount. Um, sometimes they do it towards the west coast, sometimes they do it towards the east coast, sometimes they do it both at the same time. Um, but what happens is that water is so full of nutrients um, that, uh, that the uh, it results in algal blooms off the coast, essentially. And those nutrients are a product of, of agriculture, among other things. Algae blooms are something that have been occurring naturally in the state of Florida for um, you know, thousands of years, uh, but the severity of the algae blooms has not nearly been as high as it is now. Um, because you're taking a system that is accustomed to red tide, for example, on the west coast, and then pouring in nutrients to it and then it just exacerbates the impacts and you see these really ugly stinky cyanobacteria blooms um, that cause fish kills and marine mammal kills and things like that so and that's from uh, fertilizer or pollution or labor yeah pollution. a combination of, of all of that oh. that's totally right who's doing anything about that <laughs> well it's just that you look at the idea people speak of pesticides. Every single day in these gardens. What's the need for it? There's no need for that whatsoever. I mean, it, it is disgusting. I mean, I, people whom I know, I have told them, you know what this does to the ground? Oh, it doesn't matter if we want green grass or we want nice flowers or we want, yeah, but you know what it's doing to the water? It's talking to the wall. And these are supposed to be educated people. You know? Right, yeah. It's a waste, a, a total waste to people like that because they just don't adhere to anything. So I guess if you multiply a concept That's and you go to people to the capital. Well it's with supposedly sugar, the sugar in there. Yeah, it's the sugar. sugar. Yeah. Yeah. And is it partially because the EPA is in disarray? No, yes. no, these algae blooms have been going on for, for some time now. Um, I mean, that, no, it's, the, that it's not being attacked. I, I mean it, it's actually my understanding is that it's a state level issue. Um, and the state gets to regulate the uh, the discharges. Well, not necessarily the discharges. They work cooperatively with the Army Corps on the discharges. But um, in terms of fertilizer type and content and potency, that's a state level regulation. Um, that the the state of Florida has the ability anyway to um, make those regulations more stringent. So a really great example of a state doing that is California, for example. California takes uh, the broad federal law and generally makes it a lot more stringent for pollution purposes uh, for the state because the state of California is in a real environmental tipping point for a lot of different issues from air pollution to water pollution and um, water scarcity and so forth. Um, and so that's something that maybe the state of Florida and our representatives should really be considering um, for nutrient pollution. Yeah. This sounds pretty serious. question. So uh, it's funny that we, we're talking about these blooms that are happening off the coast, but um, in Miami-Dade County, we, we have been undergoing an algae bloom ourselves. Um, it's just not a visible algae bloom in the way
way that these big green blooms are on the coast. Um, so uh, Germ, in particular, um, has been uh, evaluating, at least my understanding is within the past few months, evaluating its sampling protocol and um, procedures and sort of trying to take a look at, they've been sampling the same areas for decades um, without changing those areas over time, but our sources of land-based pollution have changed over time. Um, what, a great example of that is the Coral Gables Waterway. Um, so you might know the Coral Gables Waterway has the Biltmore right on it, uh, which is a lot of <laughs> really uh, potent fertilizer going into the waterway. And so um, the samples being pulled out of that waterway are very, very high um, in nutrients. Um, and it's contributing to a microalgae bloom that's been um, totally unprecedented in Miami Beach County. Um, and some scientists are currently studying, including those at Durham, how these nutrients are, are impacting our marine environment, uh, particularly our seagrass beds. Um, you might know that, uh, for example, up by the Julia Tell Causeway, we're having a massive seagrass die off right now. And some scientists, and I'm not a scientist, but some scientists um, are studying and evaluating whether or not that's a result of, of nutrient pollution. Um, so the issue is, is that um, nobody is, uh, at least to my knowledge, violating laws. Um, so there's, Durham, as an enforcement agency, can't do much because there is no enforcement to be done, or if there is, it's very little enforcement to be done um, related to um, runoff and nutrient pollution. So that then begs the question, okay, well, if there are no laws related to this, maybe it's time that we um, take a step up and start implementing some laws that have higher standards for this type of pollution. And so that's something that we're working on um, with, in cooperation with NOAA and something called a, that's called the Habitat Focus Area Grant. Um, we're working with local municipalities and trying to work on some fertilizer bans uh, for over the summer, um, during the summer months at least when it's so rainy. And we're trying to get some bans uh, in place for, for certain fertilizers uh, that are really contributing to the nutrient problem. And, uh, it's as you were saying, a lot of these fertilizers that we use are really unnecessary. Our soil in Miami-Dade County is really nutrient rich as it is, so adding additional fertilizers just saturates the soil and it ends up running off anyway. Um, so a lot of other municipalities throughout the state of Florida, um, including in, in Sarasota County and Manatee County, have implemented um, these fertilizer bans and they've really seen a reduction in the amount of algae that they have in their watersheds and in their estuaries over there over the past few years. So it's something that we're trying to get going um, down here too, to hopefully give Durham a little bit more enforcement power. Have you, do you test the temperatures? Have you noticed an actual rise in temperatures of the waters? And do you think that might be contributing to the algae bloom? Absolutely. So the, the temperature, at least to my knowledge, um, we our water quality monitoring program um, has been looking at sewage indicator bacteria, so haven't really been looking at temperature, although it's just a, a factor that we pull out. We haven't been analyzing the temperature, so to speak. Um, but folks I know at Rasmus have been analyzing the temperature and throughout the state, and I, my understanding is that the temperature is increasing, and of course those higher temperatures are creating sort of an incubator environment for the algae, um, which is causing them uh, the blooms to be a lot worse. Absolutely. And so who might tie the to global warming or you know, instead of our this resilience and mitigation mm -hmm. after it happens. Is there anybody thinking about like hands on in Florida or Dade County? Now everybody's worried the tides are rising, you raise the houses, we put more sandbags, we do all right. these things, all you know solving yeah. a problem after it's occurred. Is anybody looking yeah. more closely at temperature rise in general? Yeah, well I mean there are a lot of folks that are working on resiliency issues as you can imagine, but I love what you're doing here in framing resiliency in a different way because it's something that I talk with my team quite a bit about um, at Waterkeeper is that um, water resiliency is something that we don't really talk about all that much. For sure we talk about sea levels rising and flooding, but we don't talk about how the areas that are being flooded are brownfield areas that have persistent organic chemicals um, in them and these sites haven't been reclaimed. We haven't talked about how uh, septic pollution um, is uh, increasing with the amount of flooding that we're experiencing, and those pollutants are going into our waterways and loading into our waters. We, we don't really talk about um, how uh, the rising water table overwhelms our sewage system from below, um, and infiltrates the cracks, and then causes overflows, and then those pollutants go into our waterways. So um, that's sort of a piece of the resiliency discussion that isn't regularly talked about. 
um, and I would love for it to be discussed more. And in fact, and I encourage you all to come, um, on August 1st, we are having an event called a Tidal Town Hall in cooperation with Rethink Energy Florida. And we're inviting a bunch of uh, elected officials and those who are running for office um, here in this next cycle. Um, I believe it's August 1st, and it's going to be at the CIC Center um, up by, uh, I want to say, where? Yeah, right by the hospital, right? Um, anyway, so, yeah, Cambridge Innovation Center, yeah. So, um, and so that, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'll be a free event, and you'll get the opportunity to ask all your elected officials a bunch of questions from all the districts um, and the folks that are running for office. And one of the questions um, they've asked me to draft for the moderator was related to water quality impacts from sea level rise, storm surge, and flooding. So, another thing to add to that, this is also all the toxic waste that's going to be floating underneath. Right. Because that's going to be coming up as well. Right. 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 Absolutely. That, and um, I also posed a question about Turkey Point nuclear power plant yeah. um, and issues related to the cooling canal system and flooding and. Um, uh, water table infiltration from below through the groundwater um, with the hypersaline plume situation that's happening over there and all of that. It's really intense. This is not so frightening. <laughs> it is. It is frightening. Yeah. Yeah. We're. Um, I've been working on FPL stuff here for a few weeks now because they're trying to extend the the license for the power plants down there um, to 2052, um, which would make them the oldest operating plants in the United States. We all know that the cooling canal system down there is failing, uh, and it's very contaminated. Uh, the saltwater plume that it's creating is approaching our drinking water aquifer at a rate of about a little less than two feet per day. Um, and so that plume is slowly migrating and it contains uh, a bunch of different contaminants. Um, so the <laughs> FPL is currently petitioning for a license extension that would allow them to continue operating those same cooling canals um, through 2052. Um, so not only would they be the oldest operating reactors in the United States, the plant would also remain the hottest operating plant in the United States. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, they don't adequately consider sea level rise, storm surge, or flooding in any of their planning documents. So we're pretty concerned about that too. <laughs> can you briefly say the salt tank location? Um, it's going to be at the Cambridge Innovation Center, um, which is up by the, the UM hospital. Um, like 15 minutes from here. This particular event is focused on environmental issues. So if you really care about environmental issues, it's a good chance to evaluate these folks who are running for office and how they respond to the things that matter most to you. So we invited folks from all the way up and down the spectrum, from local government, folks running for office, uh, all the way up to Ileana Ross Lane and C. Um, yeah, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a great event. Um, August 1st. It's on our website and it's on our Facebook too if you um, follow Facebook. 5.30 to 8.30. Um, Robbie's going to pull it up now too just so oh, you great. have all the information and the, the address. So it's, yeah, it's on 7th app. Yeah. First, all of our events are on Facebook and on our website um, at mindmewaterkeeper.org forward slash events. I, well, I'm really, I am really hopeful about our Keep the Scheme Straw initiative and I encourage you all to come out. Um, for the final reading of that, which will be an ordinance, uh, final reading, second reading, and I think it's on August 24th or 28th, I'd have to double check. I'm doing really bad with dates tonight. Um, but yeah, it'll be, a, yeah, it'll be on the Keep This Game website, and Community Foundation, Citizen Science Project will share it, and we'll share it to you. Um, but you all can come out, and that I think will be a really monumental um, step. There's gonna be some discussion amongst your council members about the straw ban and what it means and how it's going to be implemented and then they'll take a vote and I'm hopeful it passed on first reading so I'm hopeful it'll pass on second reading as well and then um, with a certain amount of adjustment period uh, we'll have no more plastic straws on Keep It Um So that's something that's really actionable and tangible and a real difference that we're going to make here in, in August I hope um, in support of the community. So. We've been working on the plastic bags with the major two stores that we have, which right. is CVS and Winn-Dixie. And we always get the same reaction. You know, we try to give out, we give it away with the bags that are reusable so people get into that habit. But it's a hard habit to break. It is, yeah. And so 
they say that they have to get the direction from their main offices, CVS or Winn-Dixie. Yet I corporate, thank you. <laughs> but at the same time, there is one Publix in Carl Gables that has no plastic bags. And that's so the one you get. The paper the shopping bags. Carl Gables got plastic right. bags. Carl Gables banned plastic bags. In all the stores or just? All the stores, yeah, that's Carl Gables. No, no, no. But the stores are allowed to use up whatever um, plastic bags that they've already bought so that, you know, whatever stock they have, like, doesn't go to waste. A lot of them have tons and tons of plastic bags already. So, um, but Coral Gables does not allow plastic bags anymore. So once that's used up, they have to switch to paper or do something else. Yeah, California and then Oregon. I know part of the issue that this council is waiting for is Coral Gables, the state of Florida and the Florida Retail Federation came in and said, hey, no bans on plastic bags in the state. We're done with that. Uh, because a number of people, the state. <laughs> the state of Florida did. Yeah, so they, they have a ban so, on bans. Right. So they, they came in and they did what's called a preemption. They said, we're preempting you, local government, from passing any laws related to the governance of plastic bags. Um, done deal. And so that's when. Um, through municipal home rule, which we talked about today, Coral Gables said, we have the ability to govern our trash streams. We're a municipality, we're in a home rule county, we have a charter, we're allowed to do this. So now this is elevated into a court challenge and the, we're still waiting on a decision from the third district court of appeals. And once that decision comes out, which we hope will be a favorable decision towards Coral Gables, because we strongly believe in a municipal, municipality's ability to self-govern, um, meet the needs of its constituents. Um, so once that decision comes out, I think we will see a flood of municipalities coming on board and saying, we also are banning plastic bags. Right now, municipalities are a little bit gun shy because of the litigation, so they don't want to get sued for banning plastic bags. However, plastic straws were not in the state preemption, which is why municipalities are more easily able to ban plastic straws. And the resolution is essentially just like a very strong suggestion um, but that they have passed that on the key, but they, like she said, they're, they're a little gun shy. They don't want to get sued by the state, so they haven't passed the ordinance to ban plastic bags. But there is interest, definitely, like not just with residents, but also with the council. The, the, um, the straws are, are catching on because there are a few restaurants on Brickell, like Caratoni's, they don't use plastic straws okay. anymore. There's a few restaurants yeah, on the yeah, yeah. yeah. that they don't use either. Yeah, the Yacht not use plastic straws anymore. Yeah, the Ritz doesn't either, I think, or at least the. the well, I mean, to me, it looks like if this ordinance passes in August, then everybody will be bound by it. So, on the key, anyway. All right, other questions? All right, how about we break out into like um, some small groups here, two to three people per group? I think you all have some advocacy scenarios. Discuss them, discuss your approaches, what different techniques you could use. Could you rally your community? Could you sign a petition? Could you call your representative? How can we approach these environmental issues from an advocacy perspective? So it's front and back, so feel free to pick whichever one you want to do. Uh, let's start with the first scenario. So I'll read it out loud for the camera. Uh, it says, Max loves to fish in Visiting Bay. He notices that the once large and plentiful fish he used to catch are now smaller and less plentiful. Max hears that the National Park is developing a general management plan that includes a proposal for a marine protected area. What can Max do to show his support for this plan? Second question says, one year later, due to the community's efforts, a marine protected area was created. Max and his dad went out to visit the MPA and saw someone illegally fishing. What can he do? And the final question is, Max knows enforcement must be intensified. How can he get the word out? So. What were some of the approaches that you all took to address these questions? Fish and wildlife. Notify fish and wildlife. Notify fish and wildlife with the illegal fishing. Absolutely. Fish and wildlife or the national park in this instance, for sure. What could Max do to show support for the general management plan? Did you guys discuss that at all? So, um, 
some of the things Max can do to show his support for a general management plan is he can attend the public meetings. Uh, every general management plan that's drafted for state parks, recreational areas, national parks has public meetings. They also have public comment periods. So they'll have a public meeting, they'll have a separate opportunity for you to submit a comment. You can go in and you can submit a verbal comment at the meeting, um, which will generally be held at whatever the park is. Or you can send in a written comment, which is something that we do at Waterkeeper a lot. We'll write technical comments and then we'll allow the public to um, issue a form letter um, based on our technical comments um, to the same agency that's overseeing the management plan. So those are some things you can do. You can generate awareness about the plan on social media. It's not really a sexy topic to comment on general management plans, but it's, it's really important for the conservation of our resources. So you can get other people involved in commenting. You can share the link with your friends and encourage them to write letters or attend the meeting with you. Um, the next question on this was, what can you do about illegal fishing? And we already touched on this. You can notify law enforcement. Um, what if you don't know who the law enforcement body is? Um, well, generally a quick search will tell you if you don't know and you're out on the water on your boat, does anybody know what channel you can use to call law enforcement? Um, there's a number for the Coast Guard. Yeah, there's a number for the Coast Guard on your VHF radio at 16. If you're on channel 16, you can mail the Coast Guard. And you can, um, you know, don't use that lightly. It's, uh, a very uh, sort of emergency situation, but if you see something really dangerous going on out on the water and you're outside of cell service, then that's definitely the method to do is to use your VHF radio. I think that the Coast Guard would be a little annoyed with you, I have to say. Um, that's more if you sell something, someone doing something really illegal within the national park or something or even if you saw like an oil spill happening, like you see a fishing boat that's running along shore and you see that they're spilling oil from their vessel and you're too far from shore to, to notify the authorities, you can just buzz the Coast Guard on your, on your radio. And every boat should have a radio. If you don't have a radio, you really don't. Uh, <laughs> you're also not in compliance. So other than calling on the Coast Guard, like if you do have a cell phone Yeah, you can. There's an app. An there is an app and there is like a, a hotline online. They have an 800 number that you can call to report illegal fishing. Um, a lot of times they have, depending on where you are, if you're within the national park or, or you're outside the national park, you can, uh, a lot of these are voicemail services, so you just call and report your incident. Um, and uh, uh, also a lot of the agencies, including Fish and Wildlife, have an online forum. So say you're enjoying your day, you don't want to ruin your day with a call to an agency, a law enforcement getting involved, you can just, um, some agencies allow you to send a text, you can tweet them, or you can send a, a private anonymous tip um, through an online form on their website. And it's pretty easy, you can just Google it, and be like illegal phishing and wherever you are, and it'll, it'll generate and you can submit the complaint. Um, so the next question was, Max knows that enforcement must be intensified. How can he get the word out? So a great way to get the word out, again, is through social media and raising awareness. Um, Max can do a lot of things. He can go and knock on doors. He can attend a commission meeting and speak out at a public comment period about this issue. He can call his elected officials and say, hey, we need to appropriate more funds for law enforcement within the national park. This is getting crazy. Because it's a national park, it would be a national issue, a national elected official that he would have to call. So a senator or a representative. Uh, you can call and say, listen, we need more funding for our national park so that we can have rangers out on the water patrolling because this is an issue. It's supposed to be a national park. It's supposed to be the Yellowstone of South Florida. And instead, we are having illegal fishing happening. So let's increase some enforcement. Um, so there's a lot of different approaches that you can take. Um, I think this was a good exercise to run through some of the options, and then we'll hear what you guys did. Yeah, I'm just curious um, what you said earlier in your presentation. Um, how many people does it take to initiate a series of petitions? Because you know the like change.org, you can go there and you can sign up your petition and you can send yeah. it out. And, you know, people come up with thousands of signatures quite quickly. How many does it take to make a difference? It's a good question, right? It sort of depends your jurisdiction. If you're in Key Biscayne and you have 20 people, 50 people who really care about an issue and sign a petition and that goes to a council member, to me, that's a lot of people getting involved in the political process in Key Biscayne, for sure. Uh, if it's a state level issue, you're going to need some more people. 
um, to get involved, to really make a presence. Of course, um, with anything, most, uh, most elected officials have legislative staff, right? So when you call, um, the whoever is the legislative aide will pick up the phone and will be like, well, tell me what issue you're concerned about, and I'll make a note. And with most offices, and I've worked for elected officials before, they'll have a threshold. If like more than three people call in one day about the issue, you have to tell the elected official that people call. Um, some elected officials say if one person calls about the issue, I want to know about it. Um, so for, for the most part, if you have the more the merrier in terms of uh, highlighting issues with your electeds, but in terms of a, a referendum for the, for the Constitution, I'm not sure exactly um, what the requirement is. It's, I could probably find it really easily online, but I know that it's like a, for a statewide issue, it has to be a certain amount of people from each district, I'm pretty sure. So that can be a challenge. All right, so which one uh, Which one did this group do first? Underground, uh, pipes. Uh, the second one. <laughs> flooding. 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 Okay, number four. Number four. Number four. Okay, this one says, Samantha lives in an area that experiences king tides and flooding regularly. Even the soccer field that she practices on after school is sometimes too flooded to play on. Samantha is worried that this flooding is only getting worse, and everyone seems to be ignoring it. What can she do? Question A says, what types of changes could she ask for that would protect her community? And what types of habits could she recommend individuals adopt to address sea level rise? Do those are some Samantha? Open-ended question. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did you guys come up with? Come up with that we should check her drains. The drains are going to the Absolutely. Ocean, the, the pretty fresh I was doing when I was I oh, discovered so many of them were all blocked up. Wow. Well, mine in particular and my neighbors across the street. And so I kept calling, calling, public works, nothing was done, nothing was done. And then when I went into well, I went into the office and they told me all the lighting lines were out and they would never come out. And now they come down all the drains and they're doing this on a regular basis. Wow. So that's awesome. Good for, for you. Yeah. <laughs>
is, are there any um, guidelines for like what individuals should do? You know, like to reduce their carbon footprint that actually are effective. I mean, I know of course there's so many things we shouldn't do, but sure. do. But is there like the top three list that might actually affect our own community if we all take them on board? That's a good question. I'm not I'm not sure what the top three list would be. I think that it's just yeah, I mean I think I think that there's <laughs> I'm a big proponent of meeting people where they are. So it's like you don't have to go cold turkey on decreasing your carbon footprint, but even if you just take gradual steps, I think that raises your own personal awareness to addressing some of these things. So maybe that means you're carpooling, maybe that means you bike to work, maybe that means you're using our metro rail to get places or the bright line now or whatever. Maybe it means that instead of taking multiple you know, cross country flights per year, you're only taking a handful. Flying is a really big contributor to, to carbon emissions. Um, and you know, there's a, a lot of other options. Instead of driving, maybe you have a, uh, an electric vehicle that you'd like to use. And around here, everybody drives a golf cart, right? Can you take the golf cart more often than you take the car? Um, those types of questions. Uh, and then of course, your personal consumption matters a lot too. I'm sure you all are familiar um, with how our, our meat industry impacts um, carbon emissions. So even committing to do something like Meatless Mondays, for example, um, really makes a difference on an individual level as it's extrapolated over time um, and, and things like that. Taking those small steps, although they might not mean a lot individually, um, collectively they might mean a whole lot. So. so I'll tell you a quick, I don't know if you've heard about WeWork. We work at the office sharing company yeah. yesterday and the day before that banned um, meat in their offices because wow. they have kitchens where they're shared kitchens so you get your own little office space with your shared kitchens. And they've also said they won't read any business meals that have meat on them. Wow. Meat and chicken. So interesting. They only will allow fish. There you go. But they're huge. They're all over the world. That's great. Yeah. 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 I mean, it doesn't have to, like I said, it doesn't have to be cold turkey to do some meat pun, but um, <laughs> even if it could be something like maybe we're working together as a community to encourage uh, local restaurants here to have a meatless Monday option. Um, that's a lot special. So if you go in and you go in for an early dinner or happy hour or something, you can have a sustainable dinner and meatless Monday meal um, once a week. See, that's such a great idea that's to take to the school. The kids could sure. do that. Because that's something they can get their heads around. They can do it properly all the time. Yeah. Outreach. That's a great there aspect. is there is one place at least that is doing that. Oh, really? I can't remember if it's popular. are so popular here, the line bikes. Yeah. They're there everywhere. They are. They're getting around, yeah. that's for sure. They come from the same, they get down from all over the place. Yeah. Right, they do. We should do something to make sure that there's a better way for living a bike. Yeah, I know. Because I, I ride my own, I have my own bike. So oh, great. And there's many times I've got to come home with the bus and see how I ride the bike. has been grappling with some of these issues too. Um, and my understanding is they recently banned the bike sharing companies, but instead they have, I guess, instituted a specific type of bike sharing where the city is able to manage the bikes more appropriately. Yeah, so instead of them being can't, ditched everywhere. Can't, uh, but just that in instances like this, which is not, I mean, we can all be friends. It's annoying. That of course. Yeah. Slight, slightly annoying. Yeah. Um, is when you go to CVS mm -hmm. and there's only one little bike there you go. stand and there it is full of these bikes the right now it's that only the blue bikes and and that shouldn't be because the people who are using their own bikes but then there's a lot of people cycle here sure on their feet so I, I, I really I mean I just don't need to say I keep on it fast of course but that is that's frustrating you know because you go down and put your bike in Change, right? and it, 
your idea is great. It's nothing about what you're saying about, yeah, we don't tighten the bikes up. But how do you initiate change when everybody has their thing and their tangents and all that? Well, I, I don't know if any of you have ever heard Mayor Stoddard speak from South Miami. He's, oh, yeah, he's, he's a great speaker, but he likes to say that um, everybody has their one thing. And he says, be accountable for your one thing. Learn everything that there is to know about your one thing. And you know, nine times out of ten, educate people, get, you know, advocate for your one thing. But the ten percent of the time that you're not advocating for your one thing, when somebody asks you to help them with their thing, you help them with their thing. And you can count on them because you know they're an expert in their thing. So so I think it's a it's sort of this good commentary about the fact that like we should be educated and knowledgeable about whatever we're passionate about um, most of the time, and so that people know that they can come to you as a resource for these types of issues and these problems. Maybe your thing is biking, and maybe your thing is drains, and you know, <laughs> you know, and they know, like, oh, these are the things that you really care about, and, and you'll be a great resource and an advocate for those things, but also be willing to help other people out with yeah. their things, too. Try to focus on broader issues, even though we're a small regional organization, but we want to empower you all to take action on the smaller things that are happening in your community. So here's why we're here today talking about how to navigate the bureaucracy, right? This is super well, cool. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's so cool. Great. <laughs> All right. Um, why don't we do um, the lionfish? The lionfish. And learn that lionfish is a delicious fish to eat. <laughs> but you know how to. Could you actually? Could you actually? stand and say they're delicious because I've tried. No, I, she I think it's it. delicious. Yeah. It's, it's a How? really nice uh, one because I, 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 I put it in the oven. They, it all came out purple. Like the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think oh, I was like, my daughter. This looks so good. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's read this question first for the, for the camera. Jordan loves snorkeling on South Florida's coral reefs. He notices that he sees a lot of algae on the corals and sometimes he sees they are bleaching. He wants to help fight against biodiversity loss in Florida's marine ecosystems. What organizations can he get involved with? The next question says, lionfish and invasive species in Florida are threatening native species due to their lack of predators. What kind of campaign can Jordan design to decrease lionfish populations? And the final question, what type of initiatives can protect our coral reefs as a whole? So let's answer the first question. Um, what types of organizations can Jordan get involved with um, to help uh, fight against biodiversity loss and marine coral or coral reef bleaching and, and algae development out on our reefs? What kind of organizations? you guys. <laughs> so there are a bunch of different ones. We've got the Southeast Florida Coral Reef Initiative. Got the coral is that the university, or is that? No, that's not. That's through uh, the state of Florida, right? Um, yep, state of Florida does that one. We've got the Coral Restoration Foundation. We've got Rescue Reef out of University of Miami. Um, a bunch of different folks. Uh, Frost Science is working on some coral reef uh, uh, scientific efforts. If you haven't been to the, to the new science museum, they've got a coral lab over there, and you can watch the science and or scientists and residents do coral work research on these issues. You can get involved with the National Park, of course. Um, uh, and uh, there are actually a lot of uh, dive shops locally that host lionfish derbies and things, which uh, really help to eliminate the, the species from our reefs. So a bunch of different options you can get involved with, um, from the private side to the public side to the nonprofit side. Um, so the next question is, what kind of campaign can Jordan design to decrease lionfish populations on the reef? You can host a derby. That's right. Did somebody have the idea to approach Whole Foods, or did Whole Foods have the idea themselves? Because that, that you can buy. Right. They, you can buy like they have Whole Foods and and Right. I'm not. I'm not sure. They've been approached a few different times, and eventually just kind of decided to lean through it. Okay. And it was one of those things where people were like, "Hey, you know, maybe you should try this." And I think it, it was a few different since then. I, I mean, at least I've heard from different people that they're like, you know, I tried to talk to my local. So I think it's been a few different times when they've been approached about carrying lionfish and then eventually just decided, like, you know, we've heard this enough times, maybe we should look into it. Publix also, actually, still will have lionfish. I don't know if they have it regularly, but or it might be a situation where you have to ask for it and then they'll have it for you, like, the following week or something like that. Right. So for me, um, I've been involved in medical conservation a lot. So normally to decrease something from happening, and you don't want to create a demand. 
So for me, if you're gonna have Whole Foods and Poverty Express selling lionfish, and all of a sudden everybody loves lionfish, <laughs> and then all of a sudden everybody that's, that's asks true. for it, and then you know how sure. we repopulate lakes and things like that because sure. people like fishing a certain type of fish. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of you're starting a little fire in a different way because you're creating a demand for something that shouldn't be here in the first place. So I think that's a dangerous game to increase the demand for something you don't want. It's a very good point. Very yeah. good point. I'm so in because I can't do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's a terrible idea. I mean, it's just, you know, so I, I know that's not a solution, but sure. it's, it's a little bit of a red flag. Yeah, that's interesting. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. for sure. Um, some other things that you can do to raise awareness in terms of campaigns um, is just to draw more attention to the issue um, in general, whether that's notifying the media of the derby that you're having to help eradicate the lionfish on your local reef, or, or whether it's um, you contacting your elected officials and saying, hey, we need more funding funneled into Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission so that they can send out rangers who then send out folks like Dana who can go and spear them as their job. Right? Um, instead of creating a market for right, it, you right. put some money into um, yes. the state agencies yes. who are meant to go out there and remove them themselves, yes. or the national agencies that's in this case. case. So, um, so those are some options too, right? Increasing funding, increasing awareness. Uh, the Lionfish has been a really successful uh, awareness story uh, because it, it has gained sort of like this uh, viral media presence online where people know that when they come to Florida, these are a problem for our reefs. and that's. That's really great, and frankly, I wish that we could do the very same thing for a, a bunch of other things that are impacting our reefs. <laughs> they're very visual. Though. Right, yeah, they're very visual, exactly. So, um, but so something yeah. about the, the just occurs to me the bleaching and the equipment of the coral reefs that I just learned two weeks ago is that all the sunscreen we put on and then jump in yeah. the sea yeah. is killing the coral reefs, yeah. and I don't think people know that. Yeah. I mean, so that's just yeah. education yeah. information. Right. That should be another campaign. That would be a great thing for this game to support. Yeah. Is that locally, you know, if they show up promoting a type of sunscreen that doesn't kill your trees. Right, yeah, right. I mean, I, I think that there are a lot of other things that are stressing corals and causing them to bleach more, more than that. But the point is, and this resonates, is that corals are at a tipping point, so they can't handle additional stressors right now because the ocean is so acidic and, uh, you know, temperatures are so warm and the corals are already bleaching, and when they're bleaching, they're not quite dead yet, um, but they're in a very vulnerable state, and so one little thing can tip them over, and um, that's what I think we're seeing with the sunscreen problem, is that if it was a perfectly healthy coral, it might not impact it as much. Maybe it would over time, but um, the problem is, is that our corals are not healthy right now. So any little impact um, does them in. The, the biggest problem is the warming of the waters. Yeah, the warming of the waters, um, and then also the, the nutrient problem that we're having. So we're seeing a, a lot of our corals are, are smothered in algae uh, because there's so many nutrients in the water coupled that with the temperature of the waters um, and the algae smothers them so and then of course we have the mechanical impacts from, uh, from hurricanes and storm surge and those things which are naturally occurring and generally our corals are pretty resilient to storm surge and, and hurricanes uh, but what they're not resilient to is things like dredging projects so I don't know if you're familiar but the Port Miami dredge happened a few years ago and um, they smothered over 200 of our reefs and yeah. our, our coral reefs and dredging sediment and that's something that our corals cannot handle um, they have to photosynthesize to live and um, putting dredging sediment on top of them is not a good way to ensure that they can live um, so we actually brought a lawsuit over that um, and preemptively brought a lawsuit in port everglades in fort lauderdale about the same thing they're going to dredge their port up there too so you guys put that down yeah yeah dana and i, and I are actually going diving on Friday up in Port Everglades to scout some sites um, that are key coral areas um, that are going to be impacted by the dredging project. So we're trying to flag them in advance so that we can check on them after the dredging project and if they're significantly damaged then we'll bring a, bring a lawsuit. Did, did anybody actually see if there was a big rise in, in income through the, the catamaran ships being able to come into the Port of Miami? Because it doesn't seem to me, I mean I know it's a big cruise ship sure. industry, but I don't think yeah. they required that yet. Um, it's, was right, the, the, yeah, it's the container ships that require the depth. Um, there is some debate in the community about this right now. Some folks say that there has only been one post-Panamax ship in port 
Um, but other people say that um, the dredging channels is still too narrow for the Port Potomac ship. So there's been rumors that the Port of Miami is going to be dredged again. So they can get two ships in. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's it's some, I'm not really sure what the economic um, dividends are on on the whole situation yet. Um, Huge. But I do I do have some questions about. Um, what sort of the economic efficiency is of dredging a deep port here in Miami and then doing the same thing in Fort Lauderdale 20 miles up the road. <laughs> um, so, all right. Um, well, we are a little bit over time, um, so I don't want to hold you guys for too long. I want to thank you all for coming out today. If you haven't filled out your surveys, please do. It helps us show metrics of success for our grants so we can continue to offer programming like this for you all, um, free of charge. Um, and as I mentioned, if you're interested in our events and other programs like this, definitely check us out online on social media. Check out Key Biscayne Citizen Science Program online as well. Um, and the Foundation, of course, which has been so generous in their support of Miami Waterkeeper and all the work that we're doing. And if, if you have any other questions about anything that you're working on, from bikes to drains and anything in between, um, you can find me online uh, or send me an email. I'm at kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at miamiwaterkeeper.org. Also, I just wanted to point out, I put another uh, of Miami Waterkeepers events up on the screen. Um, if you or any women you know are divers, uh, this should be a really interesting event. It's specifically to you know, showcase women in science, women divers. Um, they plan on having uh, the first dive is uh, cleanup to pick up trash around there. And I don't remember what was the second dive. Just fun. Um, okay. Second <laughs> so dive was just for fun. <laughs> just to look around and see things. You can get trash for it. And then we'll have a, a little cookout. Um, at the marina afterwards. Um, so please, by all means, share this. If you're not a diver, we're trying to get some, some more people involved in this event. And again, yeah, we're partnering with the Community Foundation on it. We'll be at Divers Paradise. And if you don't dive, you're welcome to join us on shore for the cookout. There will be a lot of, be a lot of uh, fun loving water ladies out there. So if you look around the room, I think you guys fit, fit the description. <laughs> is that the one in Cranton? Or is it yep, the, yep, uh, yep. The one across the street. Thank you guys again for coming and thank you. Thank you.